Okay, so let's grab this. Not that. Um, let's get rid of this and grab this. So guys, but really, in all honesty and in my defense, um, the reason that I forgot to do this is because I spent all day, thir I was here until like 7 o'clock Thursday night. Guess what I was doing? Fixing laptops. Yeah. So three of them are um, beyond repair. Um, the beeper, right? The beeper's gone. Um, <laughs> And in addition to that, two of the machines that were charged to 99% and you pulled the plug in the battery, that was you guys, right? Um, those are gone too. But we now have 17 computers that work and it only took me the entire night. So that's why I just bugged on Thursday and I'm sorry. So with that, yeah, right? So guys, with that said, questions about the homework. You better have some because you all came in here complaining that I didn't have the answers posted. Go ahead. Okay. Hold on, 23? Oh, there it is. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's take a look. Um, hey... Okay, good. So, guys, um, little little insider tip. When you get to college, your textbook becomes your best friend, right? Interestingly, my son, who's up at Utah State, many of his professors would not provide to him physical textbooks. And, guys, you got to understand, my son is very much like you. Well, I should be careful. I don't know how to say this without being offensive. Um, he, he, he will do what it takes to get by, but seldom much else. Are we just being real? Okay. And, and, but wildly successful. My wife, does, this is being recorded. My wife doesn't understand it because she's that person that when she got to high school, you know, the first day of class, the professor or the teacher assigns a paper. It's due in a month and she wrote it that night, right? She was that person. She does not understand my son who's like, I'll get to it eventually. Um, but guys, he's very good student, but you kind of do just what's asked of you, right? So my son at Utah State found very quickly the digital textbooks. Sorry, you guys are pirating books, and I know that's the case. But he found quickly that digital textbooks just don't do the job. And so he actually ended up finding physical copies of the textbooks and actually went and bought them even though he didn't have to. With that said, guys, when you get to college, most of your physical textbooks will have solution sets in the back. So guys, let's have the talk. Who writes these solution sets? Blurry-eyed, starving graduate students. I know that because I was one of those blurry-eyed, starving graduate students that wrote the solution sets for an educational psychology book that I went over when my professor was writing it when I was doing my graduate work. Because I can guarantee you I made mistakes. I know I made mistakes, but the money was so stinking good that there was no way that I was going to pass it up because they paid me by the solution set and not by the hour, and I could work twice as fast as she thought I could, and I never told her. And uh, I made a lot of money. Just saying. But guys, the bottom line is this. Roxy, who wrote these and later ended up hooking up with the author of another chemistry book. Have I told you this one? Um, oh, it's unbelievable. Where did, go? oh, here we go. So Roxy, who wrote the solution sets to these, actually ended up hooking up with Steve Zundahl. And I think they even got married. So long story. But anyway, <laughs> just saying. So guys, the bottom line is these many times are wrong which is why I spend the time to type them out. It doesn't mean I'm better than Roxy, it just means that I could focus on the few that I really want you to know. So if you get in this tension between what's in the back of the book and what does Knappenberger have, 
um, trust mine. The, not because I did them right, but because these have been out for several years and my mistakes have been found and corrected. Okay? So trust mine. I know for many of you this hasn't been the case because you've never had to look in the back of the book because they're normally posted, but that's the deal. Okay, so back to your question then, Daniel. What are we thinking? Okay, so we're, but I'm okay here. You're okay. We're do, then we're good. Okay. Guys, what else? Anything you all want to talk about? You're really okay? Go ahead. Well, sort of a picture for my life. 25 what? All of it? Okay, so where, where could I focus that might be a good place? Yeah. Right. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. Let me let me I, I tried the best that I could to highlight this when I taught it to you. But yeah, where does the point four eight go? What's the variable? Right. And the variable is the rate. So remember, rate is change in concentration, or you learn down here, change in pressure, right? That was interesting. But it's change in molarity over time. So this, that thing in the box is your variable. So in this case, the negative 0.48 replaces that. The negative is outside that. Remember, we add the negative because it's being consumed. And then uh, the two is outside that because that's the coefficient. Is that okay? Does it look better now? Okay. What else, y'all? You sure? You're really okay? Are we done? Okay, so guys, with that said, let's be really clear on this. What are these called? Rate expressions. Guess what you're going to learn to write today? Rate laws, right. So guys, please do not lose sight of rate expressions um, because while they're not wildly important, they will show up on the test, so be careful. So guys, with that said, I am going to freeze this and we are going to record scores. And again, my apologies for dropping the ball on that. And now you know a little bit more about the way websites are set up. Okay, so we're here and add an assignment and even though that's frozen I still have to do this over here Brayden were you good uh, Matthew Donnie you good Soph Annika Ethan uh, Ishmael Josh Diana you good Chandler Isaac how about you Ellie all right, Landon, yep. Nathan, yep. Emma, yep. Max, yep. Leslie, you good? Yep. Gage, yep. Ronnie, good? Yep. Kaylee, yep. Spencer, yep. and Daniel. Yep. Meredith, you good? Okay. Yep. All right. So guys, here we go. So as you're getting settled, let me explain to you the way, well, actually, maybe even a bigger thought than that. I think we talked about this earlier, but let's do this again. Guys, was it really, really apparent that when we were going through the gases stuff that it's just dead to me? Like I, teaching gases for me is like super duper painful. I don't find it interesting. I, sorry, I shouldn't say this, but it's really true. I'm just like, okay, they're gases. They get bigger and smaller. I'm done with this. Let's move on. Um, but guys, we need to do it. Sometimes you just got to do stuff you don't want to. Guys, I love this stuff. The stuff that we're getting into now, the rest of this year to me is fascinating. Um, and it really starts here because we're going to start talking about reaction rates. And guys, one of the reasons that I love this so much 
is it allows us to really dig deep into some of the chemistry that's going on and talk about some really interesting things. So guys, today what we're going to do is we're going to start into a conversation about what are called um, reaction orders and rate laws. But this is, well, it's interesting. It's interesting on its own, but it's really interesting where this is headed. Um, we're going to start talking about reaction mechanisms. And guys, you're going to see, we're going to understand rate laws. We're going to write a couple rate laws. And then I'm going to call time out and I'm going to be like, guys, stop taking notes. And I'm going to introduce the idea to you of reaction mechanisms. And many of you are going to be like, you know, I never thought about that. And we're going to start talking about this idea of reaction mechanisms. And I'm going to throw out some terminology and we're going to talk about it a little bit. And then we're going to come back and really get into it on Thursday. But guys, I think that's one of the things I love about this is it's not just a thing unto itself. It's the beginning of a much bigger conversation. And I think you're going to like it too. So guys, let's get started. So this is review. I don't know that you need to write it down, but let me bring you back to this. So guys, to this point, and I want you to really focus in on this, to this point, we have looked at data that represents the relationship between concentration and time. And guys, I'd like to zoom into this, and I'd like to talk with you about all, oops, I'd like to talk with you about all the interesting things that we found in this data chart. Remember, we talked about the idea it was methyl chloride um, reacting with water. It formed, uh, I'm sorry, butyl chloride reacting with water, and it formed a butyl alcohol and hydrochloric acid. So guys, dig back in. Braden, join us. Dig back in. So what did we discover? What did we learn? What did we talk about relative to reaction rates that we see summarized in this table? Go ahead, Ronnie. Okay. And guys, let me just ask you right now, is it okay if I talk about calculus? Is it? But please understand if you're going, no, it's not okay, but I don't really feel like I can say that. You guys understand there's no calc in this class, right? The only reason that I bring it up is because some of you have done or are doing calculus. And for me, it's nice to know that the stuff that I'm learning really does have purpose and meaning. And guys, a lot of it's seen in this. So is it okay if I touch on it? Okay. So Ronnie, with that said, you said as reactions go on, they slow down. Is that what you said? Okay. Can we talk about why? Guys, why do reactions slow down as they go on? Less, keep going, Donnie. What? Beautiful. Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something a little different, though. So Donnie said there are less reactants and therefore less collisions. And it is about collisions, right? We understand that collisions are the thing that make reactions go. But when we say less, remember, we don't mean less simply by amount, we mean less concentrated. And guys, that's the critical issue. Yes, there is less. They're being consumed. But ultimately, that creates a decrease in concentration. Simply less doesn't mean the reaction will slow down because we could have less reactant and we could squeeze it and the rate could stay the same. See what I'm saying? So it's less concentrated, which means we're assuming the volume's not changing. And guys, that brings us to this idea of molarity. It's not moles, it's molarity. And guys, the reason I'm making such a big deal out of this is at the end of this unit, we're going to start talking about the rates of acid-base reactions. And it's going to be all about molarity until we get into the next unit. And then it's going to be about moles and the whole thing blows up. So guys, you got to be careful that you understand this is a molarity issue. Nathan, you were going to say something else. Absolutely. And now we're talking second derivative, right? So the rate at which it is slowing down slows down, which probably makes sense because the reaction is slowing down. Therefore, the reactants are being consumed less rapidly. Therefore, the rate at which it's slowing down is slowing down. First and second derivative if you go there. But that's a great point. Guys, what else? Other things that we talked about. We okay? Yeah. 
good. They never fully go to completion. Guys, it's sort of a trivial thought, but understand that's true. They don't actually go to completion. You okay? Yeah. Right, and, and so we, I forget, somebody asked about that even last time, but remember the idea is that while in theory it makes sense that there should be one left, and when that one thing that's left reacts, now you've got none left, right? But in terms of scale, right, we're talking about 0.1 molar. So if we have a liter, that would be 6.02 times 10 to the 22nd things in a liter of water. It's uncountable, more stars in the universe, right? And because in reality, we're talking about such large samples, the idea is that it never practically gets there. It is an asymptote. We never, n reactions don't actually stop. We call them stopped, but they don't actually stop. Do you buy it? It's the difference between theory and practice. And for us, we treat them the same. Yeah, reactions end. But we understand that there will always be a little bit of reactant left. Um, and but we treat it as if it's gone because practically the concentration becomes so low there's no more collisions and the reaction is in fact done. But, in th but really there will be a little bit of reactant still there, it's just not enough to sustain the reaction. <laughs> Does that make you feel better? Okay, then I'll say yes and we'll leave it alone. You guys okay? Okay, so guys here's what I want you to do. You got to be careful. As you look at this data chart, without knowing it, guys, subliminally, your, eye, your mind is organizing data. You've got that weird orange heading. You've got a gray bar that defines your units. You've got columns. You've got time. You've got molarity. You've got the calculated average rate over these time intervals. But guys, I bring this up because I'm about to show you another set of data. And it looks the same, but it's radically different. Don't get lulled into thinking it's the same. So guys, the deal is this. While this gives us a picture of how reactions behave over time, that is not the way that we as chemists think or talk about reaction rates. We do it differently. And guys, when we look at reaction rates in the setting of being an analytic chemist, we actually look at them like this. So guys, we are now going to look at another reaction. This is the reaction between, ooh, can you tell me what NH4 plus is? Ammonium and NO2, which is not nitrate, it's nitrite. And guys, that results in the formation of nitrogen and water. Here's the data. Just a second, Spencer, stay with me. Hold on, no, 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 stay with me. So guys, let's look. It looks the same, doesn't it? But do you see that this data is radically different? And guys, this is now, we've been leading up to this. So what we did before wasn't unnecessary. But guys, this is how we think about reaction rates. And it's very, very different. So let me give you a second to look over this. Let me grab my writing tools, and then we'll talk. So guys, talk with me about the differences that you see. How is this data, and let's just babble, and then we'll bring it together. How is this data different? Go ahead, Chandler. OK, so we've got a reaction that's speeding up. What's going on with that? What else do you see? Go ahead, Matt. Oh, sorry. Let's go this way. Go ahead, Nathan. Okay. So we've got some concentrations that are going up, ammonium up, nitrate, nitrite down. Matthew, go ahead. Uh, talk about that. Good. Yeah. Exactly. I just drooled coffee inside my mask. Sorry, guys. Just a minute. Guys, that's exactly the thing that you've got to see. Where is time in this data chart? It's not. 
Guys, this is not data collected over time. And that's the critical issue. Chandler's absolutely right. He's like, wait a second, ammonium's going up. And then Nathan added to that, ammonium's going up, nitrite, nitrate, nitrite is going down. Guys, you gotta understand, this is radically different data. This is not data as the reaction progresses over time. This is snapshot data. So if you're not sure what I'm talking about, this is what it means. What it means is you're going to run this reaction, and this is what we're going to do in lab. You're going to run this reaction. You're going to get 0.01 molar ammonium. You're going to get 0.2 molar nitrite. You're going to mix them together, measure the rate, dump it down the drain. Then you're going to do it again. And you're going to start with 0.02 molar this, 0.2 molar that, mix them together, measure the rate, dump it down the drain. And you do that again and again and again. You run the same reaction with different initial concentrations in a number of different experiments, sometimes adjusting one, sometimes adjusting the other, measuring the initial rate. Mix them together, boom, what's the rate? Dump it. Measure the rate and then dump it down the drain and start over. Do you now understand how this is different from what you were looking at before? Now, guys, talk to me about what you're seeing in the data. What are the first two call? Well, maybe I should zoom out before I ask. Guys, what are the first two call? Well, the second and third columns, not the experiment number. What do these represent? relative to the reaction. Reactants or products? Reactants, right? So guys, we are adjusting the concentrations of the reactants. And then we are looking at how the reaction responds to these adjustments. Because you'll notice that they did some interesting things in terms of the pairings that they chose to test. What were they doing? And how does this data make sense? Let me let you think about it for a second. What were they doing and how does this data make sense? So guys, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a second to process this because this is really important that you see these connections. So rather have you process with me, grab the person sitting next to you and process with them. Talk with them about what you're seeing. Okay, guys, you got about 20 more seconds. All right, so guys, let's pull this together and let's see if we can come up with some great observations as a group. So what did you find interesting? Matthew, you're going to say something earlier and I sort of sent us in a different direction. Interesting. So may, let me say that back to everybody. They're trying to determine which reactants increase the rate. What is it that you're seeing that makes you think that that's the case? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, so let me, let me box this in. Guys, in the first four trials... We are holding the concentration of nitrite consistent. What do we call that scientifically when we don't change one of the factors? It is called the control. And so nitrite is our control in the first four trials. Keep going. Yeah. Okay, so as these concentrations go up, and again, I love that they put these in improper scientific notation so we can compare, they go up. So let's pause there for a minute, and now let's look at the other set of data, and I'm going to drive the conversation for a minute. Guys, in these four trials, what's the difference now? 
Switch, the, I love the way you said it. Guys, we switched the control. And understand there's nothing magic about these molarities being the same. They just need to be controlled. And so now we start increasing these concentrations and what happens to the rate? They increase as well. And you're going, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense. If we've got more reactant, more collisions, it's gonna go faster. Guys, you're gonna find that's not the case. There are reactions where you can increase the concentration of a reactant and it doesn't go faster at all. There are even reactions where you can increase the concentration and the reaction slows down. So now we need to talk. So guys, the idea then becomes this. It's not enough for us to just identify one goes up and the other goes up. What we need to do is we need to figure out proportional ratios. And guys, let's talk about this really quick. Some of you are going to want to do this mathematically, and that's fine. Some of you are going to want to do this conceptually, and that works too. You're I prefer to do this conceptually. If you want to do it mathematically, that's okay too. But guys, let's look. In the first four trials, this is our control. Let's compare trial one to trial two. What did we do to the concentration of ammonium between trial two and trial one? Doubled it. It's not went up by 0 0.01, it doubled. And guys, when we doubled the concentration, what happened to the rate? It doubled. What about this? Trials two and three, what happened to the concentration? And the rate also doubled. Guys, what about trial one to four? One to four, what happened to the concentration? Quadrupled, what happened to the rate? Quadrupled. What if we were to go trial one to four? How many times did the concentration go up? Factor of six. And the rate went up by a factor of six. So guys, what that means is any change that we make to concentration, we see a proportional change to rate. And guys, again, you're looking at this going, yeah, that makes sense. But guys, understand it's seldom that simple. Again, you're going to find examples of times where you double the concentration and the rate goes up by a factor of four or eight or 16. We'll talk more about that later. But guys, understand it's not always this simple. So now let's go down here. Now this is our control. Guys, given what we just talked about, you find the relationships for nitrite. How does changing the concentration of nitrite affect the rate? How does that compare to what you saw with ammonium? Similar. So what are we doing here to concentration? Double. What's happening to the rate? Doubles. What about here and here? Trials one to three. Factor of three. And the rate changes by a factor of three. And guys, these relationships just continue on. So what we've established from this data is any change that we make in concentration affects a proportional change to rate. And guys, this is where you want to start taking notes. And this is how we talk about this. This is what is called a rate law. I would write this down and underline it. This is a big idea. So guys, please don't write down this transitional thought, but you understand this. We've established this, that increasing the concentration of either one of these reactants affects a proportional change on the rate of the reaction. So guys, how do we represent this? Well, we represent it mathematically like this. And guys, you want to write this down. This is the rate law for this reaction. The rate law for this reaction is rate is equal to K times brackets, not parentheses, brackets. Because what do the brackets mean? Molarity. Concentration. Concentration of NH4 plus, concentration of NO2 minus. So guys, this thing that you just wrote down is what is called a rate law. 
A rate law is a mathematical expression. Rate laws represent the relationship between concentration and rate for a chemical reaction. So we've got rate, because we know that that's what we're studying. And then we've got this thing K that we'll talk about in a second. And then we've got the molarities of the two reactants. You guys okay? Because this is all about to go away. You okay? So guys, let's talk about K. K is what is called the rate constant. We are going to spend an entire day and talk about K. But guys, before we do that, we need to have this conversation about K. You guys all caught up with me? You good? Because again, this is going away. Okay, so guys, this then becomes the conversation we need to have. We are going to solve for K. This is the data from which we wrote the rate law. And guys, from this, we're going to calculate K. You'll notice that we have eight trials. So here's what we're going to do. Nathan's row is going to process trial one. You guys are going to process two, three, four, five, and six. Guys, please figure out the value for K for your trial. I will do trial seven as my example. And guys, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're typical, nobody in this room will get this right. And it's not because you can't do math. Guys, solve for K. Now you're nervous. Okay, hey guys, you got 15 more seconds and then we're going to talk about this. Ethan, what'd you come up with? It's actually wrong. Okay, guys, my turn. Let's gather together and I'll just arbitrarily choose to process number seven. So the first thing that I need is the rate. And the rate in number seven is 32.4 times 10 to the negative seventh is equal to K, which is my variable, times... 0.2. I'm just going to go 0.2 and ditch the significant digits. Um, and then 0 0.0606, like so. And guys, here's the deal. Given what I wrote down, I'm already doomed to failure. What's missing? Units. Guys, here's the deal. 
This is one of the places on the AP test that if you don't put units on your numbers, they will not give you credit for your answer. Sometimes they get a little loose on that. But as a matter of fact, you're going to see questions on the AP test that say, what are the units for K? And they don't even give you numbers. The units are more important than the value. We're going to talk more about why this is the case as we get into something called molecularity and, and um, reaction mechanisms. But guys, the units are critical. So let's do units. This is molarity over seconds. This is molarity, and this is molarity. So now, guys, as we continue to solve this, on the right-hand side, I get 0.2 times 0 0.0606. And I'm going to go two significant digits, even though that that's not completely appropriate. So I've got K times 0 0.012. Because guys, what are my units? Molarity squared. And then over here, I've got this, which I'm going to choose not to rewrite. So now, guys, as I continue to solve this for k, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be dividing by the 0 0.012 molarity squared. So I'm going to bring this over and we get 0 0.012 molarity squared. So then, guys, we need to do some canceling, right? So when we cancel, this molarity cancels with that molarity. And then, guys, what happens to that molarity in the denominator? So what's the answer when we, when we finish this? Let me do the math. Say it again. 1 over molarity times second. So it goes 32.4 times, holy smokes, times 10 to the negative 7th divided by 0 0.012. And the answer that I get is 2.7, uh, I'll go 0, times 10 to the negative 4th. But now, guys, we've got to figure out these units. What happens with the molarity in the seconds? They're both in the, numer or the denominator, so it's inverse molarity, inverse seconds. And guys, this communicates information. We're going to talk more about what that information is later. But guys, understand you've got to keep track of units when you're solving for this. Now, here's the thing that's interesting. Let's talk about the number. Did you all get 2.7 times 10 to the negative fourth? Guys, this is a constant. It does not matter um, which trial we look at. It is really a constant. Does it change? Yeah, we'll talk more about that later. But guys, for any particular set of instances, this is a constant and it remains constant. By the way, what changes the value of K? You ready? Temperature, surface area, and catalyst. Huh? See how those all fit together? We'll talk later. But guys, are you okay with the math? Does this, is this good? You're all right? Okay. So guys, there you have it. That's the idea about reaction rates and solving for K. So guys, with that said then, let's get generic about reaction or about rate laws. So guys, when we talk about rate laws, normally they can be expressed like this. But guys, you'll notice that in the generic form of a rate law, we pick up something that wasn't there before. What's new? The exponents. So guys, these exponents, M and N, are what are called reaction orders. And we understand that if the exponent is not given, it's an understood one. But these are what are called reaction orders. But guys, the data that I showed you previously was a simple one-to-one -one relationship. If, the, if we double the concentration, we double the rate, triple the concentration, triple the rate. Because understand, that is not always the case. 
But what this does do is represent the relationship between concentration and rate. Change in concentration and change in rate. And guys, it goes like this. I think you can get this without writing it down, so check it out. We have what are called zero order reactants. If you have a zero order reactant and if you double the concentration of that reactant, the rate does not change. That reactant has no effect on rate. Then guys, we've got what are called first order reactants. In a first order reactant, if we double the concentration, we double the rate. That's what we saw with the ammonium and the nitrite. We doubled the concentration, doubled the rate, tripled the concentration. The rates were proportional. Then guys, we've got second order reactants. In a second order reaction, if we double the concentration, the rate goes up by a factor of four. We can also have third order reactants. If you have a third order reactant, doubling the concentration makes the speed of the reaction go up by eight. But again, guys, the idea is that ties back to the idea that these are exponents. So two to the three is eight. So these are exponential relationships. You get the idea? Okay. So guys, with that said then, we can actually add up the overall, we can create what's called the overall reaction order by adding up the reaction orders for all of the things that make this thing up. You guys okay? You guys, are you, can I go on? Is that good? Or you, you're writing furiously. I can wait for a second. You guys good? Okay, so here's what we're going to do then, guys. Let me share with you this. So this is a fictitious reaction where we have reactant A reacting with reactant B. We don't even need to know the products, but we're given this data. Guys, write the, react, write the rate law for the reaction and then solve for K. Write the rate law for the reaction and then solve for the value of K. So guys, let's go for about another 30 seconds and then we're going to talk about this.
You guys okay? Okay, so guys, let's tear into this and let's talk about how this comes together. But guys, also importantly, we need to talk about how we're going to talk about this. You can't just write the rate law without explaining how it is you came to these conclusions. So guys, first of all, let's tear apart the data and let's establish some baseline understandings. And then we'll talk about how to talk about it. So guys, what we're looking for first is controls. And obviously here, we are controlling the concentration of A. And guys, when we control A and when we double B, what happens to the rate of the reaction? doesn't change. So what order does that make this reaction relative to B? Zero order. So guys, we are zero order in relationship to B. So now guys, let's take a look at another example and see if we can establish A. So do we have a set of reactions where B is controlled? Where? One and three. So guys, here B is controlled and what are we doing to A? Doubling A, and what happens to the speed of the reaction? It quadruples. So guys, if we double that, and if the rate of the reaction quadruples, what's the exponent that makes two and four the same? Second order. Do you see that? Okay, now guys, the question is this. How do you talk about this when you're answering this on the AP test? And guys, this is the answer. You have to reference your trials. So in order to do this, writing as I talk, it goes like this. Referencing trials one and two. Because I'd encourage you to write this down if you want an example. This is how to answer the question. Referencing trials one and two. Where A, concentration of A is held constant, and the concentration of B doubles the rate of the reaction does not change. Therefore, B is a zero order reactant. Do you understand how we put that together? Identify your trials, identify your control, and then establish the concentration change rate change relationship. So guys, with that said, scratch out the, sec the sentence that leads you to the order of A. And again, guys, without this support, they won't give you credit for this. You need to identify your trials, your control, and the relationship. You guys okay? Matthew, go ahead. Either way. Yeah, not, not trial B, reactant B, but yeah. So, yeah, so reactant, you could either say is zero order or the other is fine too. Yeah. So guys, let's talk about our next set. So the idea here then is if we want to establish the, the relationship of, of A, the order of A, we are then going to say referencing trials one and three, where B remains constant, or you could say B is our control, doubling the concentration of A causes the rate of the reaction to quadruple. And guys, sometimes like you could sometimes it's hard to know the word like eight is octuple. You could just go up by say goes up by a factor of four. That's fine. Um, but however you say it, doubling the concentration of A causes the rate to quadruple or go up by a factor of four. Therefore the reaction order for A is two or second order. Now guys, understand that all of that was simply the logical underpinnings that allows you to then write the rate law. So guys, from that, we then go like this. Rate is equal to K. Now, typically, you don't have to, but typically we put these in order of the, of the order they're given. So guys, 
relative to the concentration of A, what did we establish the reaction order to be? Two. And then relative to reactant B, what's the reaction order? Zero. What is any number to the zero power? One, so you don't put it. So guys, this then is the rate law for this reaction. You okay? Okay, now this. Without doing the math, what are the units for K? Inverse molarity, inverse seconds. So guys, let's look. Rate is molarity per second, K, and then this is molarity squared. So if we then divide by molarity, one of these goes, we end up with seconds on the bottom and molarity on the bottom when we divide. So the units for K are inverse molarity, inverse seconds. Now guys, make, just a second, Chandler, make this connection. Look up in your notes. What are the units for K for the one that we calculated before? The same. But guys, how can that be? Because these are both second order reactions overall. So let me say that again. The units for K are the same because these are both second order reactions overall. Because if you remember our previous rate law, it was this. It was K times the concentration of NH4 plus times the concentration of NO2 minus. And guys, this is first order, this is first order. You don't write it down, but that adds up to second order. This is second order because it's that reactant squared. These are both second order reactions. One is first order in two reactants. The other is second order in one reactant. But anytime you have a reaction that's second order overall, the units for K will be inverse molarity, inverse seconds. Do you see how those connect? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct, because there is no influence of that reactant over, over um, the rate, so it, it's not included in the rate law because the rate law describes the connection between rate and molarity. And if there is not a connection, it doesn't have an influence and therefore it factors out. Yep. You guys good on the idea? Wait, somebody, Chandler, go ahead. A is the one, let me, let me say, it, so changing A is the one that changes rate. Yes. yes. Yep. Yeah, it did. Correct. So if that were the case, say like, for example, uh, if this, this is going to screw up everything, but pretend, say that this was an eight and that doubled, then that would make B a first order reactant. So it would be there. Yeah. Is that okay? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, because you'd have another molarity, right? You'd have another molarity over here, and when you divide by it to solve for K, you'd have two molarities in the bottom. Yep. You guys good? Okay. So, guys, stop taking notes. Here's the question. How on earth can this be? How on earth is it that you have a reaction and if we add A, the reaction goes faster and if we add B, the speed of the reaction doesn't change? Guys, how can that be the case? And the answer is this. Let's just lend this and let's just say A plus B turns into C. We're just making this up. But let's just say that A plus B turns into C. Well, guys, here's the question that I have for you. How does A plus B turn into C? And if you look at this and you go, well, that's sort of a silly question. Well, guys, let's look at a reaction that we've actually done. Like if we take H2 and O2, and if we turn those into water, how does hydrogen and oxygen turn into water? And guys, the answer is we don't know. And this is something you've never thought of before in this class. Guys, we've been writing and balancing chemical equations for more than a year now. 
because you've got to understand that a chemical equation is basically a birth announcement and an obituary. Where does life start? Well, life starts as hydrogen and oxygen if you're the synthesis reaction. And where does life end? Water. But guys, understand that in the same way that if all you knew about me was, hey, he was this long and this heavy when he was born and this is how he died, you miss all the richness of what happened in between. Well, guys, the same thing is going on here. How does A turn into, or A plus B turn into C? And these are what we call reaction mechanisms. Guys, reaction mechanisms are the actual things that are going on behind the scenes that allow A and B to turn into C. And guys, guess what? It turns out that I know the reaction mechanism for this reaction. It turns out that when this reaction happens, the first thing that happens is A breaks apart. And it breaks into what we're going to call A sub 1 and A sub 2. And then what happens is A sub 1 hooks up with B. And when A sub 1 hooks up with B, we get A sub 1B. But that A sub 1B then hooks up with A2 and it turns into C. And there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than what we ever knew. Now, guys, the question is this. How do we know what's going on behind the scenes? And here's the answer. You will never be asked to predict it. You'll only be asked to verify it. So they would never ask you, hey, what's really going on behind the scenes when A and B turn into C? Guys, that is a level of chemistry that you won't run into probably even as an undergrad. But it is very, very possible for us to go like this and they will ask you, maybe when A plus B turns into C, this is how it happens. And then the question becomes, is that possible? And that you've got to be able to answer. Either yes or no, it is or is not possible. I'm going to teach you on Thursday how to tell. But guys, how do we tell? The answer is by looking at the rate law. The rate law, which tells us the connection between concentration and rate, actually gives us insight into whether or not this mechanism actually works. Now, guys, along the way, and please don't write any of this down, but guys, along the way, we are going to talk about reaction mechanisms. Reaction mechanisms provide the information about the order in which bonds are broken and formed. These things are broken into what are called elementary steps, of which this mechanism has three. Guys, these elementary steps are described by what's called their molecularity. And again, I'm doing this quickly. We're going to go back over this Thursday. But I want to lay this at your feet now. So guys, so guys when, when we talk about molecularity, it's, it's literally describing the number, number of things that are reactants. So this, so this is unimolecular. unimolecular. There's one, one reactant. Reactant. This is this bi molecular because it's, because it's two. two. This is this bi molecular because it is also, also reactant. reactant. That's, going, That's to going to be more and more important as we move forward. But guys, the other thing I realize is we've got things here like A1, 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 they never they show up in the reaction. reaction. They get they produced, produced by one, one, one elementary step and consumed, consumed, consumed by the other. By the other. You're going to find out later these, these are these are called intermediates. So guys, what we're going to do next time is we're going to tear these mechanisms apart and we are going to figure out whether or not they actually work for a reaction. So I just wanted to lay that before you. Um, guys, this then is what we're doing for homework today. It's pretty straightforward. And guys, we will do this, on, we'll look over this on Thursday, and then from there we'll start talking about verifying reaction mechanisms. So guys, that's it. Um, let's start on our homework. We got about five minutes left. We will break at 10 after, and then we'll be back to begin third period, and we'll move on from there.